this time we're going to remember the Lord's death as we partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper, elements which re represent his body and his blood. We're going to be reading the words which our Lord spoke to his disciples right before he went to the cross. And I invite you to turn to John 15 to follow along as we consider his words. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and men here at the front will hand you one. And if you don't own one, you can keep this as a gift. We're going to be reading John 15, verses 12 through 16, where Jesus speaks with his disciples about what it means to be a friend of Jesus. Please follow along as I read John 15, verses 12 through 16. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of my father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus' disciples had been walking with him during his three years of ministry. He repeats this commandment that he's given them before that they should love one another. But this time he says, love one another as I have loved you. They've experienced his love for them for three years, but now he introduces a new aspect of his love for them. He's going to do something for them that only friends would do for their, own, for their best friends. He's going to lay down his life for them. This is the truth that we see, the first truth that we see about friends of Jesus. They are greatly loved by Jesus. The second truth about the friends of Jesus is that they keep his commandments. And here Jesus boils down to one commandment, all his commandments, when he says, love one another. The one who loves his brother the way Jesus loves him will be obeying many other commandments. As Paul said to the Galatians, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. John would later write, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for his friends, and we ought to lay down our lives for, one, for the brethren. In that passage, he admonishes them to genuine love when he says love in deed and in truth, not just in word and tongue. And then he applies this to such practical things as meeting temporal needs of brothers when you have the means with which to meet them. Jesus is greatly concerned that his followers express the same love that he has for them to one another. This brings us to the third truth about the friends of Jesus, and this is that they are privileged to have access to the mind of God. Jesus says, all things that I've heard from the Father I have made known to you. Friends of Jesus enjoy an intimacy with God that mere slaves do not enjoy. Friends of Jesus have an uh, they, they, they're, have, have a, uh, yeah, a slave, it's just not what slaves do. They just do the, what the master says. They don't have access to his mind. There's two people that were called friends of Jesus, or friends of God in the Old Testament, Abraham and Moses. And both of these men received communication from God that revealed to them the mind of God Keep in mind that these disciples are the men that Jesus is preparing to found his church. He made known to them even further truth by means of the Holy Spirit after he returned to heaven. 
This truth is what he wants them to pass on to the church. We are privileged to know more of the mind of God than even the disciples on the earth. We learn this truth by spending time in reading the writings of the apostles. As the apostle Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. The fourth truth about the friends of Christ is that this friendship was initiated by Christ and not by the, the disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And through the words written by the apostles, we learn that we also were chosen by God before the foundation of the world. He wants us to understand that we are in Christ, not by our doing, but by his doing. We're saved by grace and not by our works. And it's appropriate that as we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we remember that Jesus had us in mind as well as his first century apostles when he died on the cross. The fifth truth we see about the friends of Christ is that they have been appointed for a purpose. I have appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain and that whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he may give to you. In the disciples' case, it seems that Jesus had in mind the fruit that they would bear would be the winning of people, new converts, as they take the message of Christ to them, that would become a part of his church. And true converts remain. They will are part of the church that Christ said he would build. And I get this because he says that you would go and bear fruit. Paul prayed for the saints that they be filled with a knowledge of God's will, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we're also appointed to bear fruit, both the fruit of the Spirit, which is the character of Christ, and the fruit of ministry and building the body of Christ up. The outcome of this appointment by God is the guarantee of answered prayer. Whatever we ask in Jesus' name will be given by the Father. In Jesus' name simply means that we ask according to his purpose. As we get to know the mind of God, our prayers will be aligned with his purposes. John writes elsewhere that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked of him. So the five truths about the friends of Jesus are that they're greatly loved by Jesus, they love one another, they're privileged to know the mind of God, they're in a friendship which, which was initiated by Jesus, and they're appointed to bear lasting fruit resulting in answered prayer. If you're a friend of Jesus this morning, you're invited to partake of the Lord's Supper. As you eat the bread, which represents his body, and as you drink the cup, which represents his blood, meditate on his great love for you. Examine yourself and confess areas that you know are displeasing to him. Seek his help in turning from them. And when your heart is prepared, you may partake of the elements. If you're here this morning and you, don't, you know that you're really not a friend of Jesus, that you uh, have not come to trust him alone for your salvation. We ask that you not partake. That this, this ordinance is ordained by Jesus for his people. But please consider that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If you would like to talk to somebody about what this means for you, there are people here that would be glad to visit with you about that. So the men will come forward now and partake when you are, your heart is prepared.